So maybe you're thinking, JCM's first non-Zeppelin episode on his channel, and he chose this album. Of all the Purple Ventures, he went for this record. Let me tell you I have my reasons, and a sort of intro the outdoor obsession with it. First, let me go back in time and tell you how I came across the album. So like I mentioned on the making of Houses of the Holy, it was during a long drive to my uncle's house that I discovered both cassette tapes for brain salad surgery and Deep Purple's masterpiece, Made in Japan. The Made in Japan tape was a homemade copy given to my uncle by his friend and progressive rock fan, Freddy Mora. And just in case you're wondering, the English translation for his last name would be Freddy Blackberry. So my uncle gave me the cassette tape as a Christmas gift, and I listened to it non-stop. The live feel of the recording was so much better than the song remains the same, and I just couldn't get enough of this British quintet. So Freddie Blackberry's Made in Japan copy was quite special. Besides the color photocopy artwork, it had a bonus track by the name of Woman from Tokyo, which made absolute sense in the context of the album. I could tell it was a studio recording, of course, and it was a perfect ending for the 90-minute cassette tape. My uncle decided to get his vinyl collection back as it was temporarily stored at Freddie Blackberry's house, keeping them safe from his wife and kids. We both went to Blackberry's house and I was thrilled to see them vinyls for the first time. CD copies never did justice to the artwork. My uncle's collection featured lots of titles including Les Zeppelin 2 and 3, Chicago, Relayer, Caravan Serai, Man in Japan, and a dark looking cover vinyl. Because I was in my early years of classic rock studies, my house became a temporary location for my uncle's collection. I didn't have a record player, but it didn't matter. I just had to have them. I got my CD copy of Made in Japan a year later. It was the no bonus track edition and I was shocked to find out there was no woman from Tokyo. I reached out to Freddie Blackberry for some answers. He laughed and said, yeah that song was from another record, but since there was room left on the tape, I thought it would be cool to add it. He said he didn't remember the album's name, but it had some bubbles on the cover. I hung up and browsed through my uncle's records, and there it was. With a strange cover and title, Who Do We Think We Are, became my alternate Deep Purple universe, past the hits and accolades. Next in the story was my music teacher from high school, whom I briefly mentioned on the making of Presence. Among the many bands and tracks he recommended was Deep Purple's song Rat Bat Blue, and like Blackberry, he didn't remember the record's title either. In retrospect, I don't blame them because they were non-bilingual boomers, and Who Do We Think We Are sounds like a riddle, you know? Back home, I checked my vinyl copy of Who Do We Think We Are, and there it was, Rat Bat Blue. I had to listen to this thing and got it transferred to a digital CDR copy. Past Woman from Tokyo, I entered the Deep Purple Twilight Zone. Yes, it was the sound of the Made in Japan Mark II lineup, but these songs were quite the odd selection. I felt a similar reaction to my early impressions of another 7th studio album, Led Zeppelin's Presence. Both records took some time to grow on me, but they revealed the vulnerable side of a signature sound of the 70s. Like fabulous exceptions to the rule, you're not distracted by the hooks, but amazed at their unmistakable musical identities. Both albums had fantastic and deceiving opening tracks that commenced a journey for hardcore fans only. The more I got into Purple's discography until 1975, the more this album seemed like a bizarre collection of songs next to the gigantic shadow of the band's hits and massive on-stage jam instrumentals. Then you add the fact the band faced turmoil and challenges within, and there's no question, this is the band's presence. So let's go back to the last days of Deep Purple's finest lineup, who recorded an album that time forgot. This is the making of Who Do We Think We Are? Deep Purple. As we know from many interviews over the years, Deep Purple's Ian Gillen stated the band was overworked by 1973, thus playing a major part in the demise of the Mark II lineup. The numbers speak for themselves. Comparing their concert data with Led Zeppelin, I can't help to think Purple's management really screwed up a great live band. 
Here Zeppelin touring numbers from 1968 to 1972. While 1969 seems like a busy year, hold on that thought for a minute. Take a look at Deep Purple's stats. By the end of 1972, they had to be burned out to say the least. With Machine Head release on March 25th that year and the smoke on the water effect, the concert tour schedules up to July 1972 were hectic but almost cut short due to Richard Blackmore's illness with hepatitis around April, forcing many dates to be rescheduled. Deep Purple toured North America three times as well as Germany, Finland, their home country Britain, Sweden and Denmark. Fun fact, the band didn't play Madison Square Garden until 1974, which explains the sort of troubled existence with commercial success for such a talented and sensational live band like Deep Purple. It's a shame the Mark II lineup never played Madison Square Garden. Imagine the reactions for such a killer setlist. The same group that had a Hot 100 hit with 1968's Hush had to rebuild with a new singer and bass player, hurting their momentum by preparing them for bigger things yet at the mercy of a divisive line with management. Unlike Led Zeppelin's tight family unit of Peter Grant and Ahmed Erdogan, Deep Purple's managers drag some of the 60s mindset of Shock Valley concerts and albums as a secondary product. Purple's first three studio albums were released by a label that had Pat Boone and Bill Cosby and went bankrupt in 1970. By 1971, the band's management created Purple Records, aiming at monetizing their efforts plus other groups as well. John Lord's Gemini Suite and Silverhead's debut album were released in 71 and 72. What I'm trying to say with all this is that they were not fully prepared for the post Machine Head effect, which was technically Mark II lineup's third album, while In Rock and Fireball remain classic cornerstone pieces filled with some of the most violent British riffs and grooves ever recorded. Deep Purple lived in a business dichotomy of not so carefully produced studio material versus their insane concert performances rivaling any band in the business with just a 10-track setlist. In an era where FM radio sold the concept of the album, Deep Purple were a different beast like early day Hendrix, giving everything they had on stage without a safety net. Può parcheggiare laddove le altre non ce la fanno e benché fra le più piccole all'esterno, ha quattro posti comodi all'interno. Se guidate in città, non dovreste guidare una vettura fatta per la città. La Fiat 126, la vettura per la città. Following a concert at Florida's Bayfront Center Arena on July 18th, 1972, you'd think the band would take some time off to rest, but no. Pressured by management who desperately needed an expected new Deep Purple product on the shelves, the band headed out to Rome, Italy with the famous Rolling Stones mobile truck. Yes, the same truck that Led Zeppelin used to record the song remains the same and the rain song back in May. EMI Italy moved their offices to Rome and was key in setting up Deep Purple's first recording session since December 1971 in Montreux. Now we can blame management for not giving the band any vacation time, but nobody in that camp could imagine their August shows in Japan becoming a groundbreaking recording. Working on the album was just another day in the office, but the creative juices were drained and tired. All they could do was sound like Deep Purple Mark II and hope for the best. Sessions for their seventh studio album began with Woman from Tokyo, but let me just state Deep Purple were still a month away from their first visit to Japan, so this probably had a different working title. I believe the instrumental was created in Italy, with Gillen later adding his vocals and lyrics about the Rising Sun experiences. I just find it impossible he could sing about stuff he hadn't lived yet, or maybe he was a clairvoyant. Musically speaking, the song has direct references to three numbers from Machine Head, from the opening hi-hat groove of Smoke on the Water to the band's scores of choice G and F featuring Highway Star. It's a deja vu effect indeed. The middle section's soft textures are reminiscent of Never Before, which employs a similar composition technique, plus John Lord's classical inspired arpeggio as resolution. A 126 bonus track was released in the year 2000 featuring a different take for this part of the song which was cut from the single released in 1973.
Ian Gillen's vocals feature all the highlights from his incredible range, including the high-pitched vibrato and falsetto. The song was only played three times in the 70s. That's one for 73, 75, and 76. It came back in full force for the 1985 to 1993 reunion period and has since become the 11th most played song from the catalog. Fun fact, the intro for Dragon Ball Z's theme song sounds like an up-tempo version of Woman from Tokyo. The second track from the sessions in Rome is a heavy rocker where we can find traces of Rainbow's Man on the Silver Mountain from 1975. It's quite sad it wasn't included in the final selection for the album. The tasty harmonic and lead guitar work move in a similar vein to Woman from Tokyo but managed to keep things fresh throughout the song. Painted Horse was released on side one of Deep Purple's 1977 compilation album Powerhouse. It was also featured in the year 2000 as a bonus track for the remastered edition of Who Do We Think We Are. McDonald's, das ist das andere Restaurant. The band was back on the road for their first ever visit to Japan, where they managed to play definite and superior versions of the studio material to the point of outdoing Machine Head. Deep Purple then returned to the United States for the fourth time that year, next to supporting acts Fleetwood Mac, Silverhead, and Elf. Then they followed with a UK cross-country tour throughout September and early October. Past two dates in France on October 15th and 16th, the band moved their operations to Frankfurt, Germany. The connection here was made through concert promoter Marcel Avram and his Mama concert business. The studio was located in a small suburb in Frankfurt, just a few kilometers away from the airport. It seems the band recorded in the space where a cinema is now located, with the Rolling Stones mobile truck parked outside, machine head style. Mary Long is one of the edgiest songs of social commentary ever done by Deep Purple. It was a jab against two British figures. Mary Whitehouse, a conservative activist long known at the time for her opinions and Christian beliefs, which she used to criticize the country's behavior and excessive use of sex and violence in its entertainment offerings. The other character here was Lord Longford, or Francis Pakenham, a member of the Labour Party with a period in office that ran from 1947 until 1968. He was known for supporting a campaign to release a murderer, Myra Hindley, from prison. Hindley killed five children. In 1972, tablets reported Lord Longford contacting Hindley just when he was the leader of an anti-pornography crusade against moral indecency, which gave him the media nickname of Lord Porn. What Ian Gillen's lyrics did was a crossover of both British figures and create a satire of government and conservative postures within the dark alleys of commerce and money. We can almost pass this as an 80s Frank Zappa type of lyrics. The music is classic Deep Purple with some of the grooves and guitar styles of Machine Head's Lazy with a very Beatle inspired musical riff at the end of the vocal segments. Mary Long has been played 275 times in Purple history. Never performed on stage to this date, it's a heavy drumming exercise with intricate riffs that fool the ear at first, but the pace and glover attack make sure this rocks hard. The lyrics refer to a superpower that makes the person shine, 
Judging by the words here, it supposes a confrontation of the rock and roll lifestyle with a source of infinite powder. Oh sorry, I meant power. The song's guitar solo comes as a modulation to F sharp. If you're a Led Zeppelin fan, this may sound familiar, as Jimmy Page employs the same technique on Over the Hills and Far Away. With an intro reminiscent of 1970s Speed King from In Rock and a middle section phrase similar to Highway Star, it's a signature hard rock venture courtesy of Deep Purple's Mark II. I read some crazy fan theories that state Ian Gillen's lyrics talk about his troubled relationship with Richie Blackmore, who were not speaking at all at the time of making the album. The hint according to fans lies in the words Black Suede as a reference to Blackmore's onstage clothing. While this may be true, I don't think the rest of the lyrics help. I want to be inside of you, but you're black and I don't know what to do. Sounds weird. Not sure what Ian was going for here. If you have any ideas, please let me know in the comment section. Probably my third favorite track from the album, and a killer guitar riff that sounds like the brother to Led Zeppelin's Moby Dick. The musical telepathy of Roger Glover and Ian Pace is amplified on this succinct construction of call and response experiments. The song's title was based around Ian Pace's drum feel, which we can hear Ian Gillen singing as Rat Bat Bat Blue. There's a portion of the riff that I believe inspired White Snake's Still of the Night. Check it out. And of course, there's the famous keyboard and guitar solo in full baroque and roll mode. A careful listening session shows this classical bit may have been sped up from a much slower take. Now, I'm not discrediting Lord and Blackmore, whom we know can play real fast, say, Child in Time. But this portion may have been a personal prank from the band, playing around with tapes and the available technology at the time. What gives it away? Well, the tambourine on the isolated drum and bass track sounds way too fast. A similar guitar and keyboard bit can be found on Mozart vs. The Rest by Episode 6. Yes, the band Glover and Gillen were in before joining the Purple. Rat Bat Blue was only played six times during the band's 1996 concert runs with the great Steve Morse. two-part blues of slow blues and shuffle blues mixed together in a sort of progressive rock blues. Yeah, that's a lot of blues. I don't really like the first portion because of Gillen's voice, where he sometimes goes Bob Dylan and then walks in a harmony tightrope, bringing it a bit too much power. Now section B, where they go into Purple's trademark blues groove, that's what I call an inspired Richie Blackmore solo, that yes, it sounds like Machine Head, but it's their iconic style. This song should be called Lazy Part 2, and that's okay. I think it's one of the instrumental highlights of the album. Closing track from the record is maybe a couple of minutes too long, because the composition structure didn't really need so much repetition for this sort of gospel ballad number. With a catchy chorus and a simple concept, you guessed it, it was never performed on stage. I will say this, the album's outtake, Painted Horse, should have been here instead. One of the absolute treasures from the 2000 Remaster Edition, it's an 11 minute jam that Source's State was recorded with Richie Blackmore on bass, because Roger Glover was late for the session. Based on the audio, it does sound like a guitarist's approach to the bass, next to John Lord's inventive and virtuoso keyboard textures, plus Ian Pace's pocket playing. Although we don't have the exact information on the session, based on the information from Frankfurt, Germany, 
I believe it was recorded there. This is a great song to sit back and enjoy. Visually speaking, it's not one of the greatest album covers of all time. Designed by bassist Roger Glover and Purple's manager John Coletta, it features an aerial photograph of what could either be snowy mountains or the ocean, with Deep Purple's bandmates trapped inside red bubbles. Quite a fitting description of their touring life for the past two years. The album's name came from an Ian Pace comment featuring Melody Maker's issue of July 22, 1972. Pace said they got fan mail both loving and hating the band's live performance wild routines. Haters would usually say, who do the purple think they are? With such an over-the-top live display of virtuoso vocals, keyboards, drums, bass and guitar works, it's easy to see why some hatred grows among rock fans and critics. The band released their magnificent and ambitious concert with orchestra less than four months after Glover and Gillen joined Purple. There was good reason to gain some enemies, but as they say, he who has no enemies has not made progress. Original pressings of Who Do We Think We Are show the gatefold made out of newspaper clippings with different headlines stating the band's popularity as unquestionable giants of the rock and roll business. Who did they think they were? Well, Deep Purple, that's who. Oh my goodness! Potato chips! How do you like them? I've never seen so many perfect looking chips. Thank you, Mr. Pringle. Thank you for liking them. Once the seventh album was recorded, it was more hard work for this already hardworking band. Their fifth visit to North America started on November 6th in Canada, all the way through December 16th, with their last show at the Hollywood Sportatory in Florida. They got a month off before going back on the road. The band's monumental live recording to end all live recordings, made in Japan, was finally released on December 22nd in the UK. And here lies what I think hurt their soon-to-be-released seventh album the most. This created a strange business environment for a rock band in which both studio and live versions of almost the same songs became their highest selling records of their entire career. The third highest selling Deep Purple item, you ask? That would be Perfect Strangers from 1985. See my point? They released two atomic bombs in 1972 that took almost 15 years to recover from. So with that scenario, Poor Guy Who Do We Think We Are was released in the US on January 12th, performing very well because, after all, it was a new Deep Purple record. The hottest band in early 1973, pre-Dark Side of the Moon, and Houses of the Holy. Now here are some numbers for you. Who Do We Think We Are sold 100,000 copies less than Stormbringer, and almost the same as ELP's Brain Salad Surgery, Bob Marley's Burning, Santana's Welcome, and Yes's Tales from Topographic Oceans. But despite the best promotional efforts by the Purple label, it was down to the fans comparing these new songs to the 1972 repertoire. And of course, this was a huge magnifying glass against good rock songs that should have been released much later in the game. The record's sameness to the previous color palette was a great place to start for a brand new Purple fan who just came across Smoke on the Water on the radio. But for the seasoned fan, this left more questions than answers. And because it was a business, there were more concert dates ahead, 90 to be exact. Who Do We Think We Are was released in February 1973 in the UK. The band was booked non-stop from January through June, with the usual Europe, England and North America agenda, plus six shows in Japan. Only two songs from the new album were played in the ways of Woman from Tokyo once, and 27 runs of Mary Long. The tour setlist was pretty much made in Japan, with little variations to the already brilliant concert experience. Here's a new one, this is what we call Mary Long, this one, Mary Long.
with a deteriorated relationship with Blackmore, management, and his health taking a hit from incessant touring, Ian Gillen presented his resignation with a long notice period to fulfill their obligations. Deep Purple's Mark II lineup played their final show at Osaka. Yes, the same venue where most of Made in Japan came from. All I want to say to all of you is thank you very much. You've been great. Thank you for everything you've given us in Japan. And thank you, really, you're the representatives of the whole world, as far as we're concerned. Thank you, and God bless you for everything you've ever given us. Um, this is the last night of the end. God bless you. Thanks a lot. Richie Blackmore's sentiments towards Gillen made Roger Glover guilty by association, which resulted in him being forced to leave the band. Thus, Deep Purple's late 1973 return to Europe with the Mark III lineup made their seventh record almost invisible to the organization and fans. And speaking of Mark III, they are one of the reasons I like Who Do We Think We Are so much. Yes, Burn was a great record and the Hughes Coverdale combo gave much vitality to Deep Purple. But when they performed the Ian Gillen numbers, it just didn't sound right, with them sometimes overplaying their parts. It didn't help either Glenn Hughes saying he didn't like the old Deep Purple songs at the time. Whenever I revisit Purple's Mark III and Mark IV 70s catalog, I'm always missing Ian Gillen's voice and Roger Glover's bass guitar wisdom. Thus I go back to the Mark II sound at every chance I have. I believe Who Do We Think We Are is a complimentary piece to Made in Japan. It works as a sort of after party and celebration of their signature sound. While these songs were written against the clock, it speaks volumes of their chemistry as a band to make them credible. They work harder than Stormbringer and Come Taste the Band, despite the compositions being more minimalistic, without a look at me attitude. It's further proof that you can change the lineup, but you can never replicate the magic. Deep Purple's Mark II could have signed the phone book and still rock hard, like very few bands back then. With all due respect to the 1974-1976 Deep Purple success, their studio albums make me ask the question, who do they think they were? Do yourself a favor, give Burn a spin and then go back to their previous album and you'll be surprised at the honesty of the 1973 release. Ian Gillen's voice will make you forget Coverdale Hughes with a smile in a similar way to Led Zeppelin's Coda after listening to Coverdale Page. Deep Purple's Mark II final studio release is a testament of one of rock and roll's greatest casualties, whose identity shaped timeless riffs, rhythms, and lyrics that stand as heavy metal icons, often imitated, never duplicated, not even by their own personal rainbow and solo ventures, reunions, or continuations. Yes, there's no hits past the opening track, but that's the beauty of Who Do We Think We Are. Play it loud and you will appreciate the essence of these virtuoso musicians. The connectivity of intention, the telepathy of endless touring, the bravado of the razor-sharp blues funk neoclassical playground, John Lord the wizard, Roger Glover the conductor, Ian Pace the machine, Ian Gillen the hero, and Richie Blackmore the spirit. This was the making of Who Do We Think We Are. The remastered edition of the album is around 20 bucks in Amazon. Go get it. Thank you very much for watching. Bye bye.